All right, we're going to go ahead and get underway with the open forum session. Um, as Michael mentioned earlier today, uh, we discontinued this session last year, and due to the popularity of it, it appears that many have requested that it be reinstated. And so we, we I believe I can speak for all of the brethren on this panel. We want you to know that we in and of ourselves are no authority whatsoever. And you know this, the word of God is the authority. And our task is if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4 and verse 11. And so we want to preface all of our remarks with that uh, understanding. That being said, as moderator, I will be reading these questions during our lunch period together. Uh, we divvy up the questions, if you will, and so I'll be uh, reading the questions and then the brother whose name is actually on this card. But we encourage the other speakers on our panel to also add and make comment as well. So it might well be the case that for a particular question, you might have three or four uh, combined responses. Here's the first one. The first one is for Brother Keith Mosier. I understand that abortion in the sense of killing a child that would otherwise be born healthy and developed is immoral. However, in the cases of ectopic pregnancies, miscarriages that do not, do not release properly, uh, septase uterus, and I may be mispronouncing that, I apologize, babies already dead in the womb, and other situations where the baby would surely not survive and the mother's life is at stake are also, these are also medically termed as abortion, but are not protected under many anti-abortion laws, even though they may be medical emergencies. And then this is the climax of the question. If it's a right to life issue, should a mother not also have the right to life. So we'll let Brother Keith Mosier begin with that one, and then we welcome our other speakers to make comments as well. There are six basic ethical positions that can be taken, and they are all taken in this country by various groups. But the most basic of all Christian ethics is life. And the idea of ethics is to come down on the side of life. And sometimes in life when there's a medical condition like is described here, which endangers the mother's life, and every one of those situations does, when you have that kind of a medical situation and a decision to make ethically, your decision has to be based on the most important life in that situation. You described one of those as the baby already dead in the womb, which is no decision at all. The mother's life needs to be protected. And so ethically, we come down on the side of we protect the mother in those cases. Uh, those are rare cases, but nevertheless, they do exist. But when you study ethics, and I would recommend uh, Geisler's book on Christian ethics for one, when you study it, you come down on the side of life because life belongs to God, not to us. Preachers often are in a hospital when a family has to decide whether or not to shut off the machine. I don't ever make that decision for the family, number one. And number two, they have to make their decision based on the medical advice being given to them. We have placed a lot of our trust in the medical profession. My oldest son is a medical doctor, but I also know that they too struggle with some of these decisions. But again, in Christian ethics, we always come down on the side of life, and in this case, the most important life, that's the mother. And the mother who has other children maybe, who has a husband, who has a home to take care of, in that sense, ethically, she becomes the most important life.
wanted to add that uh, there's a huge difference between someone trying to have a baby and a doctor having to make a decision at the moment of choosing to save the mother's life. The doctor goes in trying to save as much life as possible. There's a, that's a huge difference between that and someone deliberately driving to an abortion clinic for the express purpose of seeking an abortion, not out of any kind of an emergency. And so it's really comparing apples and oranges for sure. There's no comparison between the difficult decisions that a doctor has to make when he's trying to save as much life as possible and the person who goes to an appointment fully knowing the purpose of that appointment is to end life. That was what they started out wanting to do. The doctor didn't start out wanting to end the life. He wanted to save as much life as possible. And sometimes it's not medically possible to save both. And so those difficult decisions have to be made, but they shouldn't be compared to what's normally done in abortion clinics. I think one thing I would say is we have to define a little bit the life of the mother and what we mean by that. Because some would say she wants to go to college, she wants to have a career, she wants to do this or that. And so in their mind, saving her life is not really saving her physical life as much as allowing her to do with her life whatever she wants to do. And so, you know, he's, Keith is talking about saving the physical life of the mom and not just so that she doesn't get encumbered by having to raise a child or Let's say if you know the child is going to have Down syndrome or have some issue, you know, some would say saving the life of the mother is keeping her from having to care for that child, you know, for the rest of her days. And we're, we're, we're certainly not, not going, going down those lines. There's a huge difference between a deformed, that's the wrong term, a handicapped child and a child that's already dead in the womb, folks. And there's no, the, the medical decision there is a whole lot easier. You ask any handicapped child, and we have a nephew who is suffering, or not, so he has Down syndrome. He's not handicapped. We think he is, but he doesn't know it. And he is just the happiest child, and he shows more love, I think, than many members in the family. I think there's a big difference, and I'm glad what, what PJ said, between knowing that that mother's going to die if the baby is not uh, removed, and knowing, I just want to get rid of the baby. That's just a, a no-brainer to me. I think it needs to be emphasized that the uh, frequency of the cases where you have to choose one life over the other is so small to be almost non-existent. Yeah. And you must be careful not to let this very minute exception influence the way you view this whole subject. We've got to keep our values, and the value is that life begins at conception and that we must protect these children um, as we would uh, born, born babies. So I would just remind you that this is very, very minute as to be almost non-existent today that, that you have a case where one has to die and you have to choose which one. It's one in 100,000 births, Glenn. One more comment. You know, one of the things people say to support abortion is that uh, we need to have abortion because of the danger of deformity and things of that nature. But are we living in a country that for the last 200 years, we have said we're a Christian nation based on Christian principles. We're gonna take these people and care for those who are in need. But this thinking suggests the idea that if someone's not as perfect as we think they ought to be, We'll just destroy them. And at what point are we going to draw that line? In fact, if we start thinking that way, uh, after my accident, they shouldn't have saved me because uh, I, I don't meet the standards anymore. And so when we even start thinking that way, we're setting the bar about uh, who is worthy to live and who is not. And it's a complete violation of what this country has been built on in biblical principles. Okay, thank you, brethren, very much. Uh, the next question here has, uh, it will begin with Brother Wayne Webster.
question is asked, should one without the right to marry, and we understand that to mean the scriptural right to marry, should one without the right to marry date a phone wedding? We often point out that you should never date someone that you would not marry. We point that out to our young people because you're going to end up marrying somebody that you date, and if they're not a, not somebody that you would want to be the be your husband or wife or be the father or mother of your children, you know, don't start dating them in the first place. So we've always got to look at the end result uh, that we're talking about and be concerned about that. We have to be concerned about this because if you don't have the right to marry then you've got to be concerned about putting yourself and another person as well into a compromising position, position that might lead you to sin or lead them to sin, uh, and that might lead others to sin, even but through your influence. And so you've got to be concerned about this. Now, having said that, let me point out the fact that when God made man, God said it was not good for man to be alone. And so we do need other people. Uh, there, there's no doubt about that. God created us as social creatures. We need other people. We need fellowship with people. And a person in this condition certainly needs that. I'm not arguing against that. It's, it's more the matter of how do you feel those needs in a way that's not a temptation, not sin, not going to influence other people to do the wrong thing. And so I would suggest, you know, you know, public situations where you can be friends with someone and be in a public coffee house, that type of situation, would be the kind of situation I would recommend. I would recommend that you do that in a group and not one-on-one. -on -one. And the reason for that is when you spend time with someone, you begin to form feelings for that other person. So there are dangers involved in that. That's why there are dangers involved in workplace romances. You work with this person every day, see them at their best. and So there's a temptation inherent in that. You've got to always be aware of that temptation for you and them. I know a number of people who are married today who did not start out interested in each other. They, they, they talked, they were friends, but they had no intention of ever dating or getting married, but today they're married and have a family. So, so that can occur, that can happen, and you've got to be aware of that. Let me add to this very quickly, and other others will have comments. Um, the same applies to, to, to um, social media. You've got to be extremely concerned with your friendships and relationships on social media. It's so easy to cross those lines, not just in a physical, public way that people can see, but... You know, it even offers you more privacy in that setting. And so you can begin to converse back and forth and develop feelings and develop a relationship that nobody else knows about, but that can get you in a position where it's compromising for you and for them and lead you down a road that you don't want to go. Two are better than one, the Bible says. You're going to need companionship. It's a matter of how do you get that in a way that, that is not going to tempt you or tempt somebody else. So there are ways to do it, but you have to be extremely careful and constantly reevaluate the situation that you're in. I'll just add this. Uh, when I came to Arlington 25 years ago, uh, within a few years, I suppose, in a manner or in the course of doing some visitation and personal work, I found out about a situation that they had had at Arlington. Uh, I was probably a child when this happened. It was probably the early 80s, and that would have made me a young child at that time. But there was, as I understand, there was a brother who had no right to remarry, and uh, he, he started dating a sister in the congregation. As I understand it, it was there in Arlington. It may have been another congregation. I think they were both in Arlington. And uh, at the time, Arlington did not have elders, but there was a, a group of concerned brethren uh, that went to this man, and I think maybe went to the sister also, and uh, cautioned them and counseled them. And uh, the expression that I've heard used was, just don't tempt fate. Don't tempt fate. And of course, that, that could probably be stated better than that, but I think we all understand the point of that is uh, when we put ourselves into dangerous situations, uh, often we're acting very unwisely. And so we be very, very careful. Don, do you have something to add? Two things came to my mind. One was 1 Corinthians 6, 18. The Bible says, flee fornication. 
I thought about Proverbs 5, to not go near to the door of her house. The idea is to not put yourself in temptation's way. And I like what Wade said, and that was um, spending time with people is one thing, and so you, to, to say dating, there's certain implications to that. I think you're gonna put yourself in temptation's way, and the Bible indicates fleeing those things. To have a companion in a different sense, that might be something that's a completely different idea, but the idea of dating, I think you're gonna put yourself there where the Bible says to flee from that. Um, while you're there, your, your question is the next one to lead off with. Um, is it becoming of Christians to get tattoos? Does Leviticus 19.28 apply? Can we say tattoos deface God's property, that being our bodies? And then another reference is given 1 Corinthians 12.27. The question mentions Leviticus 19.28. That passage says, You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Uh, I want to suggest that I don't believe that that is an accurate use of that particular passage. Uh, first off, we've got to be very careful about using Old Testament passages as proofs for what Christians can or can't do. The law of Moses was nailed to the cross. I also want you to notice that same chapter right in the proximity of that gives instructions for uh, concerning animal sacrifices. It requires leaving certain portions of your crops unharvested. It forbids sowing two types of seed in the same field. It tells Hebrews they were not to wear garments with two different types of fabrics, full and, uh, wool and uh, linen. Uh, there are restrictions about how a man was to cut his hair. Uh, how he was allowed to trim his beard. Uh, I would ask why in the midst of that do we pull that one out and ignore the others? Uh, the context of Leviticus chapter 19 is keeping God's people away from heathen practices, things associated with idolatry, cutting the flesh is mentioned there along with getting marks on your body. Uh, you might remember from 1 Kings chapter 18, uh, the uh, the Canaanites would cut their flesh, and when you had Elijah and the prophets of Baal, they were calling on their God and jumping up and down and cutting their flesh. And, and so there's also archaeological evidence that they would uh, tattoo themselves with the emblems and names of their favorite gods. And so I think that's the context of Leviticus chapter 19. Now, there might be a principle there about avoiding things that are associated with that which is ungodly. And certainly, uh, we've got to consider principles. Now, in the New Testament, there is not a passage that says, thou shalt not get a tattoo. But of course, there's not a passage that says, thou shalt not smoke heroin, or uh, inject your veins with heroin. You can't smoke heroin, you see what I know. But um, <laughs> what, uh, that's good though, all right? And, um, but there are principles about heroin and drugs. And so we look for principles in the New Testament. I think when you think about this sort of thing, a Christian needs to ask himself, number one, what would this do to my influence? Number two, will this be a stumbling block for others? Number three, is this engaging in good stewardship? And number four, is this going to have any negative impacts, any negative effects on me as a child of God? And so, if you can answer those questions, it's going to help you know about the tattoo. Now, I immediately think about 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I think there's a principle there about the wearing of veils. And he talks about women in the city of Corinth. And there was a cultural implication there that if a woman did not wear her veil, it sent a certain message. It was rebellious. Christian women should not go without her veil. This was not, uh, and so when Paul addressed this, he wasn't saying all Christian women of all time have to wear a veil, but he was talking about a cultural implication there. And so how we adorn ourselves does have cultural implications. Now, bring that down to the tattoo. That's something that changes with culture. When I was growing up, a kid in the 70s, the people that had tattoos, they were um, biker gangs. They were rough people. 
And so tattoos were associated with something very, very negative. Only the worst people had tattoos. And so that's what's been ingrained in my head since I was little. But that's changed with culture. Now you see many people that have tattoos. And so I think you've got to ask some questions like, what is the tattoo? Where is the tattoo? How many tattoos do they have? If they've got a small tattoo of a big bird on their ankle, that's going to be different than a tattoo of a black widow across their face. I mean, there are going to be implications. If they're tattooed from the neck down to the ankle, that's going to have different implications. And so you go back to these questions. How does it make people feel? What is my influence? Does it affect me as a child of God? And if you can answer these questions, it will help you uh, make a decision. But I think it really does come down to the cultural implications because there's not something in the Bible that says if you get a small tattoo. Maybe Sometimes I've known people that would do this. Maybe um, a loved one or a, a soldier might have a friend who dies in, in the war and they'll have their, um, their number tattooed on their arm to remember them. I don't think you can show anything in the Bible that would indicate that such a thing as that, as that is wrong. Let me add just one thing that um, I think goes along that follows up what Don said. We need to realize that tattoos are permanent. And, and we encounter brothers and sisters sometimes who have tattoos. Sometimes they have multiple tattoos. And we need to be very careful not to judge and draw conclusions about what these tattoos say about this brother when I know for certain in many instances, if you were to talk to him or her, they would tell you, I wish I hadn't done this now. <laughs> You know, that was 40 years ago when I was 18 and I wasn't a Christian and, and I, you know, I have regrets about that and, and we need to understand that. We, that needs to temper our reaction uh, is the fact that these things are permanent and uh, sometimes people get those things and they do regret them and if they could go back and do things over again, they would do things differently and I think we need to have that kind of compassion and that kind of understanding. One more quick comment. Yeah. I remember an older brother telling me on one occasion, he said, when I obeyed the gospel, it washed away my sins, but it didn't wash off my tattoos. All right, very good. Uh, the next question is uh, beginning with Brother BJ. Should the churches of Christ accept government funds for COVID relief? The mission of the church is to seek and to save the lost, and God has a plan for financing the mission of the church. It is for the church to give upon the first day of the week, and that is God's plan and God's method. To involve the government in church affairs is getting into exceedingly dangerous territory, and uh, this is true in a number of areas. Brother Liddell, director of the school in the past, was uh, approached uh, and told some years ago that uh, stimulus money was available for the school. And he said, no, thank you. And the government person said, I don't think you understand. We're offering you uh, a large amount of money as stimulus. And Brother Liddell said, I don't think you understand. No, thank you. Um, the bottom line was there was going to be some expectation to honor the government's gift by some kind of commitment to a certain thing that the government would then dictate. The Church of Christ already has a government. The head of the church is Christ, Colossians 1.18. It already has a mission. It already has a plan for financing that mission given by our head. Now, certainly, the Church of Christ also ought to be leading the way in compassion for those who are sick. Jesus said, I was sick and you visited me. That's part of being a Christian, whether it's COVID or any other germ or any other disease. 
The Lord's Church has the funds and the ability and the leadership to do that without the government's involvement. Amen. Um, as he was talking, it brought to my mind one thing that Ronald Reagan said one time. The scariest words a person can hear is, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. surface value, you, you think, well, that's a noble thing because they only spared them to sacrifice to God. And Brother Moser pointed out to us, yeah, that way they wouldn't have to use their own animals. You know, they're, they're not shoulders the responsibility that is rightfully theirs. That they have this opportunity to uh, let somebody else do that. And I, I, I would just add that as well. It, it is not the U.S. government's role or responsibility to fund or to do the work of the church. It's mine, and it's yours as members through free will offerings. So God help us to do that. All right, Brother Glenn, you'll be leading off this next question. Uh, please expound upon Psalm 89, verse 7. Is a casual approach to the assembly growing? I think this is a good question merely because meant for nothing else because if you do any traveling about and you visit other congregations, you see there are differences. And sometimes it's a little shocking to see the, uh, the overall spirit of what appears to be the overall spirit of worship. The psalmist says this in Psalm 89 and verse 7, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. The answer to the question is it depends on which congregation you're talking about. I don't think that it's I don't think it's everywhere. I think it's some places that the you know, casual approach to worship or to the assembly is growing. And I would also add this, we need to be careful. And Don's talked about this a few minutes ago in reference to tattoos and so forth. Um, sometimes the way that we might judge this is by the clothing that people wear worship. The principle is right that we ought to wear apparel in worship that does not contradict our profession. I, I would hesitate to go much farther than that. I think that the elders have a right to dictate what is appropriate clothing for worship, but having said that, it has to be mitigated surely by, by, the, by what is generally defined in that, in that city or town, in that culture but it's generally defined as appropriate. And that's changing. It's changing. I live in Huntsville, Alabama, and Huntsville, Alabama is a rocket city, and we have missile defense there, and we have, I, I preach for a church with many engineers. I'm not an engineer, I make fun of them, but I'm, I'm not one of them. They're my dear friends, but the point I wanna make about that is that those engineers, a lot of them have top secret clearance, have very responsible positions. They don't wear ties to work. It's, it's almost never done. They, they dress uh, casually to go to work. And, and I only illustrate, use that to illustrate the fact that, that what used to be the societal standard for what would communicate that this is important to me, or however you say it, has changing. The principle is still very valid. And I would draw the line right here, and I believe that elders ought to be able to make these kinds of judgments, but let the principle of how we dress in worship be guided by this. We should not dress in worship in a way which in any way contradicts our profession as Christians. And of course you can imagine ways that that's done.
Brother B.J. Clark will read this one off. Should the last 12 verses be in Mark 16? Try to deal with this as briefly as I can. Uh, if you're interested in a deeper or longer study, I was assigned this some years ago and wrote a, about a 50 page treatment of it. Uh, let me just say, cut to the chase here. The last 12 verses of Mark 16 are oftentimes said to be uh, not a part of the original document of Mark because two of the oldest and ancient and most reliable manuscripts, the Codex Vaticanus and the Codex Sinaiticus, don't have it in there and therefore, uh, you know, those ancient documents don't have it, therefore it wasn't part of the original. First of all, those ancient documents or manuscripts don't have John 21, 25 either and you don't ever see any of these uh, books making any kind of uh, translations, making any kind of notation about that. Plus, the Codex of Vaticanus uh, actually ends at Hebrews 9 and verse 14, and that means the rest of the book of Hebrews is left out. And also, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. Do you see in the NIV or any of these other translations a line that says Hebrews 9, 15 to Revelation 22, 21 are not in one of the most reliable ancient and reliable manuscripts? You don't read that. Furthermore, uh, there's those, those two manuscripts contain apocryphal books that we would not put in. So those aren't the standard. But here's what I want to get to. The evidence from the early versions. These versions predate Codex Vaticanus, Codex Sinaiticus, and their early translations of the scriptures. And guess what? The overwhelming testimony is that Mark 16, 9 to 20 is in those versions. And then when you add to that patristic quotations, meaning quotations from the church fathers, a Sir David Dalrymple wrote the following. He said, look at these books. You remember the question about the New Testament and the fathers, the church, his early church fathers. That aroused my curiosity. I possessed all the existing works of the fathers of the second and third centuries, and I commenced to search, and up to this time, I found the entire New Testament in the writings of those early church fathers, except for 11 verses but Mark 16, 9 to 20 is included in the earliest quotations from the church fathers. Now, may I say this as I close? Maybe one reason why John 21, 25 doesn't get noticed so much and Hebrews 9, 14 and following doesn't get so much attention. Is there anything in Mark 16, 9 to 20 that a lot of people in the religious world would love not to have to deal with? He that believes and is baptized. He that believeth. And is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. You can't get clearer than that. And that's part of the problem for some folks. They've cut it out. Or, or they've tried to let some authority cut it out for them. Those are uh, comments. I'd like to say more, but I want to let the other guys who know a lot about this to get in there. Every point. In Mark 16 is repeated in other verses of the scripture even if it were not there and it is those principles are taught throughout the New Testament this particular attack is based on a uh, the B and the uh, Aleph manuscripts I want to ask a question here. You fellows, if you ever go to a seminary or a graduate school, you're going to hear the, your Bible under attack constantly from the professors using these kinds of arguments. I want to ask you a question. How many of you have used a Bible so that it's worn out? Do I see your hands? Anybody ever wear out a Bible? Maybe not. Oh, it's just that. What do you do with that old Bible when it's worn out? 
And why is it worn out? That Sinaiticus manuscript was found in St. Catherine's Monastery by a man named Tischendor, and it was a complete Bible, the whole Bible, on a shelf, and they were using leaves of it for their cook fires, the monks were. Why weren't they uh, treasuring it as the old reliable Bible? I have a question about that. I don't think they thought it was reliable or they would have worn it out using it. We have some cursive manuscripts that are far more reliable than those two old versions are. And yet the whole academic world out there bases its approach to translation today on those two ancient versions. And Brother Clark already told you, most of the B, the Vaticanus documents, not even there. We don't have the whole of it. Sinaiticus, yes, but not. In fact, there are two parts to the Sinaiticus both of which are kept in the British Museum. When Tischendorf went there the first time, he found 43 pages. Next time, a monk gave him the whole Bible in Greek, Old and New Testament, called the Sinaiticus. And again, it's in the British Museum. You can go there, when you go to the British Museum, you can see one sheet of it under glass. They'll let you look at it, they don't let you touch it. It's such a valuable document. But nevertheless, if it were such a valuable document, why weren't they using it? Why didn't they wear it out? I think we've got some documents far more accurate than that those ever thought of being. But your modern translations are based on those two documents, just two of them. And there are over 6,000 Greek manuscripts out there that could be used. <clears throat> our, our time is up. I'm not going to propound a, another question, but. I would like to just highlight something that BJ said. I hope it sank in that you, you caught that. Uh, this fellow, Dalrymple, you know, he had access to all of the writings of the so-called church fathers and upon perusing and, and, you know, pouring over those documents, he found the entire New Testament quoted except 11 verses. I hope you realize how astounding that is. And then the late Brother McGarvey back 150 years ago in the 19th century, or else the beginning of the 20th century, he pointed out at one time that when it comes to the reliability of our New Testament text, that less than a sentence, less than a sentence of the Greek New Testament comes into any question whatsoever. Cliff, let me correct that. Correct that okay. McGarvey said less than a paragraph. That's on page 10 and 11 of his book. Today it's less than a sentence. But what a wonderful thought that is, that that man knew even then. There are 36,000 Bible verses in the Church Fathers, and Dalrymple studied every one of them. All right, thank you, Brother Mayor. And that just shows how the advanced... I had to do that when he was in school, too. Don't... We, he won't get offended. He'll just say, there I go again. No, that's, that's, not, that's part of it. But that shows you the uh, the advancement, too. When we were in school, Brother Moser told us there was 5,300 or 5,500 manuscripts in the last 25 years. Now there's over 6,000. When Brother McGarvey was doing textual criticism, there was a paragraph in question. Now there's a sentence in question. Folks, I tell you, the Word of God is irrefutable. You and I, we have something that we can base not only our lives, but we can base our eternity on. All right, our time is up. Thanks to these men for all their, uh, their fine answers. Thank you for your attention. About a three or four minute uh, break will be yours, and then Brother BJ will speak following that break.